two, one. Hey, Jimmy Murphy here with the second episode of the Montreal Hockey Now podcast. Of course, my co-host Marco D'Amico joining me. And we've got a very special guest. Uh, I've known Darren now for a while through the hockey media business. And Darren Drager is joining us, TSN Insider. And Darren, let's get right into it. On Friday, uh, you kind of dropped a nice little grenade in the Montreal uh, Canadiens media market uh, saying that Joel Armia could be moved. And there is interest in Joel Armia and, and teams willing to take on that contract. Yeah. Uh, if you could just kind of circle back and, and you know explain how that's possible. Well, you know, I can appreciate how most fans would look at it as a long shot when you look at, you know, Armia's play <clears throat> since getting the contract extension. Uh, but in saying that, you know, you're, <coughs> excuse me, you're always going to have teams that are interested uh, in both interesting contracts with maybe bigger cap hits than what, you know, a cap team would look at. Like I look at Arizona again, right? <coughs> And Arizona is going to be challenged next year with getting to the floor. And you look at the number of forwards that they have on your contract, not that many for next yeah. season. So I, I subscribe to the old theory where there's a will, there's a way. Now, do I believe Armia is going to be traded? Again, it's a long shot. Do I know that teams have called and asked about him? Yes, yes, I know that. So let's be careful here to you know, just distinguish between mm -hmm. what is speculation, what is tire kicking by outside general managers, and what is real. What is real is the contract. And for the majority of teams, they wouldn't have any interest. But, you know, Murph, I'll, I will say this. When when you're fixated on one market and one team, yep. man, the world is just closed in on you. I can tell you that, of course, managers aren't, they're not blind to the fact that Armia has not posted the numbers that were expected, mm -hmm. but they also recognize that he's not that far removed from being an important piece uh, in Montreal and in the National Hockey League. So it's not the longest term ever. So again, as long as there's some creativity and flexibility from Montreal and from the team that has expressed some interest, I think that there is potential in an Armia trade. Marco? I mean, I, I agree. I think that any Armia trade is going to have to require creativity, that Montreal take back a contract. Uh, I don't know that they would be willing to give up one of their three slots of salary retention over three years for someone like him, but definitely to make the money work. I could see it definitely happening. And we were talking about, you know, Arizona. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about Arizona. Then I kind of saw that, you know, uh, his, his contract the last two years is 4.8 and 3.8 million in actual salary. So, I was thinking to myself when you're when you're sitting at five uh, five what five thousand maybe six thousand fans uh, in the next couple of years in Arizona and they they would more be along the lines of going for a Weber deal. I definitely see like teams like Seattle, for example. I definitely see like teams out west, uh, L.A. Uh, you know the Mark Bergevin link uh, looking for a player like that, uh, really to kind of shore up either a young roster or a, a roster that's starting to compete. I'm, you know, I'm glad you brought up L.A., and I want to get Darren's take on that. That's a team, I think, obviously, you know, we're on the East Coast here, and like you said, we're also talking Montreal, and it's very Montreal-centric. doesn't really open their minds sometimes to what's going around around the league. And, you know, for the last two years, Darren, I'm sure you've been keeping tabs on it too, L.A. has been building to that point where they've got enough prospects, they've got enough draft picks, and they've been filtering guys into their system, but also keeping that arsenal of picks and prospects where they could finally maybe pull the trigger on yeah. something that impacts the current lineup. Do you sense them being one of sort of, I don't want to say a sleeper team, because I think, you know, people like you and I and everyone that pay attention to it don't necessarily get caught off guard, but more of a right. dark horse team, so to speak, at the deadline. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think that, you know, Rob Blake and the LA Kings are very aware of where they're at, right? And they know that... They've got older pieces who still feel like they've got enough left in the tank that they can challenge for a Stanley Cup. Mm -hmm. So Blake wants to, you know, give them that opportunity, but also develop a bridge in a transition, right? You know, you always have to be wanting to bring in age-specific players that can help you now, but are also part of building the future. So that's why we continue to look at Jake Chikrin as an example with mm. the Arizona Coyotes. And there's so many teams that can be attached to Chikrin. You know, I'm still not convinced he's going to be traded. I believe he's going to be traded, but I'm not 100% convinced. 
because I know what the ask is, but I also know that the Los Angeles Kings pretty much right out of the gate have been one of the most interested teams in Mm. acquiring Jake Chickren. So that's a classic example of Blake realizing that a piece like that could most definitely help that team go deep into the West if possible. But the added value comes in the fact that you've got cost certainty in Jake Chickren at 4.6 for three plus years. So whether it's Chickren, another defenseman or Blake just looks at, at bolstering what he has organizationally up front, whatever, I most definitely think that the Kings are going to be a player in the next 10 days leading up to the deadline. For sure. Marco. I mean, yeah, we were talking about them before and, you know, Chitrin makes a ton of sense. Uh, you line them up, you know, right next to Doughty. Uh, and then you kind of have like Sean Dersey on, on the second uh, pair kind of holding things down. It makes sense to me. I think that they yeah. need to shore up their left defense um, right now. Edler is not getting any younger. Tobias Bjornfoot isn't necessarily going to, to be there. And most of their top younger prospects will be like Helge Granz or, or Brant Clark, and they're on the right side. So it makes a ton of sense for them to go for, for Jake. I mean, right from the get-go, I was like, well, they have the assets. They have the first-round pick. They have the cap space. It makes, for yeah. me, it, it's a fit. I hear you, Marco. The only issue with it is what do you have to give up to acquire him, right? Like yep. so many teams have been attached to uh, the possibility of Jake Trickren. The Florida Panthers have, have been there as long yeah. as the LA Kings. And there are some horror stories about what Bill Armstrong is asking from Florida, right? <laughs> like names like Spencer Knight or Anton Lundell. I mean, go down the list, but I get it. I'm not being critical of Billy yeah. Armstrong. I mean, yeah. you've got this 23 year old top defenseman, who you'd like to think is part of the ongoing rebuild in Arizona, uh, he mustn't feel that way. So now you're having a look at uh, a market. So if you don't trade him between now and the trade deadline, well, maybe you revisit it in the offseason. It's not Bill Armstrong's job to do Rob Blake or Bill Zito or Doug Armstrong or Don Sweeney or any general manager, and there have been many who have expressed interest. It's not his job to do a favor to those guys. For sure. Marco, I know you want to get back to some Canadians talk here, so fire away. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, and we were talking about Jacob Chitron, and I, I feel like, you know, his availability affects the fluidity of the defensive market. So yeah. is, is, is a player like him, is the situation with Hampus Lindholm, uh, is, is that really what's holding up, you know, the trade talk when it comes, or at least the activity when it comes to defensemen, uh, most notably Ben Chirac? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it does feel like if one of those pieces goes, then maybe we'll see a few more. Um, Just for selfish purposes, I I hope that none of them go (laughs) until March 21st or around there. Um, You know, I I think that the Montreal Canadiens have had to do a bit of a rethink uh, with with their positioning and the options that they're now willing to consider for both Sherrod and Petrie. And I'm not saying that they were initially uh, opposed yeah, you know, I think that you you look at past deals, right? You look at the David Savard trade, ultimately he ends up in Tampa Bay. And, you know, you're kind of sitting there going, wow, boy, did the Lightning pay a lot to acquire that piece. So we've got Sherratt, you know, uh, pending unrestricted free agent. He's got to be worth something in that vicinity. Uh, but teams are loath right now to give up a first round draft pick. They just are. Uh, maybe that's because of lessons learned and past deadline deals, et cetera. Uh, but now Montreal, I think, is looking at some of the other options. So if it's not a first round pick, maybe it's a good young prospect, right? Maybe it's a good young NHL player. So just bring your best offer and, and we'll see if we can work with it. If Ken Hughes and Jeff Gorton had a deal that made sense, they'd have made that deal instantly. We wouldn't be talking about Sherratt because he would have moved on. Same thing applies to Jeff Petrie. Same thing applies to the other cast of, of players who are available in Montreal. So to some degree, I, I, I tend to agree that, you know, you've got guys like Josh Manson floating around out there. Um, I, I don't, I can't come to terms with why Pat for peak and the Anaheim ducks would trade Hampus Lindholm um, of the three between Lindholm, Josh Manson and Ricard Raquel, you know, Lindholm feels like a piece that you should be trying to hold in house. I mean, look, I mean, we've seen Anaheim this year. 
I think that they overachieved in the first half, but I also don't see them being that far away from being a, a legit contending team. Yeah. You know, maybe two seasons away, you're going to want a defenseman like Lindholm. Um, Manson is interesting. He's got the trade protection, all of that. So go down the list of all the available defensemen. We can do that. There's there's quite a, a number of them. Um, but yeah, when one goes, then maybe that kind of pops the market a little bit because you get that reactionary sort of play. You know, if, if one team in your division or in your conference makes a move and now you're sitting here going, well, I wanted that guy. I wasn't willing to overpay. I better jump to the next guy or I'm going to lose him. That happens every year. You know, one thing we hear too out of Montreal is one of the biggest questions, and it's not obviously not going to happen at the deadline, but it could be a potential, not it could be, it will be an issue, I believe, in the future, is obviously carry price. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is that what happens with him potentially in the future? Is that hampering anything right now, Darren? Is that having any effect on how yeah. Montreal approaches things? I, I think it absolutely has to, you know. Um, you know, you, you look at the goalies that they have in house, uh, they've got Caden Primo, who's still developing. They've got Montembeau. Uh, I mean, there's not probably not a long-term fit there. And then you've got Jake Allen, who's healthy again, or close to, um, there's gotta be interest in Jake Allen on the trade front. Has oh, to, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, just given the resume, the history of Jake Allen, any of these meddling teams or teams that, you know, Toronto, uh, Edmonton, you know, teams that, don't have the cap space to go big game hunting. You can kick tires all day long on Mark Andre Fleury. I get that. That's that's just managers doing their due diligence. But Jake Allen would would make sense to me. He'd be an affordable ad for those clubs. How can Montreal trade Jake Allen? Now, I mean, they can't. You know, based yeah. on the uncertainty of Carey Price. You know, more and more, just as we tick away the calendar dates, it seems unlikely that Price is going to play this year. Um, you know, we don't get much more than a modest update every other week on the fact mm -hmm. that he's in the gym, he's back on the ice, you know, he's had this setback, that setback, but beyond that, there's certainly no guarantee of, of timeline. So what that tells me is how can you guarantee what his future looks like right. beyond this season? And I think Montreal needs to, to understand and know that, you know, before they do anything in goal. Yeah, and, and just quick follow up on price. We'll move on from there. But, you know, one thing I think people need to keep in mind Darren is go back to the expansion draft and he signed off to, yeah. to, to, to be exposed. I mean, what, is, how much does that player factor now? I know a lot of people look at it and say, well, he's got a no movement. Will he, well, he already said he'd go somewhere. So does that yeah. play a role as well? It, it might different circumstance, um, you know, in that Seattle isn't that far away from where Carey Price grew up. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a part of the world that he's very, very familiar with. So specific <laughs> to that. Yeah. 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 You know, maybe his, you know, he just wanted to, to expose his family, his kids uh, more to that side of the family. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to guess what, what Kerry was thinking when he did that. Maybe he felt like he just needed to change, you know, keep in mind uh, all of that was going on prior to you know, him taking stock and taking responsibility for his life off the ice yeah. and, you know, going into uh, rehab and, and everything that he's done to to get his life back on track. So, you know, it's an unfortunate situation for Kerry. We know that he's a fierce competitor. We saw that, you know, in their march to the Stanley Cup final mm -hmm. last year. I know that in his heart, he'd rather be playing in the NHL. Um, and, and beyond that, I just don't think that he's at a place where he's willing to think beyond that. His focus is entirely yeah. on getting healthy on and off the ice. Sounds like he's doing a good job, but to suggest that, you know, it's not going to happen in 10 days, but to suggest even yeah. that this off season, he goes, okay, you know what? I'm feeling as well as I've felt in years. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking for a change. I'm willing to do what I need to do. But here's the team that I'm willing to go to. <laughs> yep. He's not going to give. He's not giving Ken Hughes a list of five or ten teams. That's yeah. not going to happen. If yeah. big if it gets to that point, it, it's just interesting too. You know, obviously, I just watched what happened with Tuka Rask here, and it was it was tough. I mean, I'll be honest, it was sad. I mean, I've covered this guy now through his whole career, and yeah. just to see him come back and and, and see that optimism he had yeah. and getting back in, and then to just have reality sort of slap him in the face that it's over. It's, it's tough to watch. And I'm just, I'm curious to see 
where that goes with Carrie. So what's something we'll keep an eye on. Marco, yeah. you want to go on? I mean, with Carrie Price, I think this is what's delaying the flexibility of the Montreal Canadiens. Because if he's not playing this year, I mean, they basically have, what, six, seven million dollars in, in LTIR space that they could still maneuver with and, and, and yeah. make trades. So that also hampers them from from right now. And then I guess you're going to have this is what's going to determine whether or not or how active Kent Hughes is going to be in the summer, because if he knows the carry price is coming back, well, then there's a market for carry price. Right. And then there's teams that are going to be available for carry price. And then that allows you to, to project accordingly as to what it is you can do, how much money you could invest, who you're going to resign, who you're going to target if yeah. you want to be a player in, in free agency. So everything revolves around carry price again, still to this day. Yeah. And it's also part of why you're not going to get, uh, get Ken Hughes to use one of the R words, right? Rebuild, mm -hmm. renovation, retool. He's, he's just not using those words. Um, because they're they're trying to go about making the Montreal Canadiens competitive um, in an expeditious fashion. That's not saying they're going to take shortcuts. They're not. But, you know, Montreal, as we all know, is a very attractive market. Like, you know, I mean, aside from having to deal with restrictions of a pandemic, which, you know, was extreme in Quebec as it was here in Ontario, knock on wood, we're all hoping that we're, we're beyond that, of course. <laughs> yeah, we'll do um but if we are, then I think Montreal does become an intriguing and an attractive market for unrestricted free agents. Well, you can't get in that game if you don't have the space to get in that mm. game, right? Um, so, yeah, there's, you know, Carey Price is the, the biggest question mark of any when I look at the Montreal Canadiens. Mm -hmm. what, you know, you mentioned there that he won't use that word rebuild, won't even say reset really just it kind of avoids any type of definition of what's going on. But I don't know about you, Darren, when, when they hired, let's just go back to Gordon when he was hired. And yeah. I just look back at what happened with the Rangers. And I remember that the Bruins were involved in that because they ended up getting Rick Nash. And that was right after they wrote that letter to the fans, you know, get ready. This is, this is what we're doing. Right. And it's going to be a lot of change and it could take. And then all of a sudden, you know, what was it? Two years later or three, they're signing, you know, our Timmy Panarin. And, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, they're making this push. They're trading months. for Truber. And it's just, do you see that happening in Montreal? Is that, do you think that's the mentality? Or you think they're kind of taking it day by day, month by month? No, that has to be the mentality. Otherwise yeah. you, you'd embrace a more traditional approach. Right? right. I mean, you know, they've got Caulfield, they've got Suzuki, they've got some interesting young pieces. They don't have a whole lot coming to be fair. Um, so if, if you were going a more traditional role uh, route, you would take it between the eyes. Like, yeah. I mean, you, you'd want to finish 30, 31, 32, and you'd love to get a hold of, of Shane Wright. Uh, and then you'd look to next year and you'd see Bedard, you'd see Mishkov, you'd see some of these top players <laughs> I know that are coming up in the 23 draft, and you go, yeah, that that's how we <laughs> need to build a foundation. The problem with that, though, is... The market. Um, yeah, the market yeah. is... is it, it's, it can be volatile, as we know, and the expectation is always high. And on top of that, yeah. guys, you've got a very powerful alumni, alumni voice in Montreal, and many of them, in French and English are on air. So yeah, they drive the narrative <laughs> on, on many days there. And I get it. I love it. I'm entertained by yeah. it. I'm informed by it. Um, I just, I, I, I can imagine how difficult it would be to, to work that way. Um, but look at, you know, why do we think that Jeff Molson went after Jeff Gordon? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Jeff Gordon is, is a respected manager. Of course he is, but you know, I think Molson is a shrewd enough hockey person, certainly a businessman to realize that, man, there was a teardown that needed to happen. So so how do yeah. you do it, right? He looks at what happened with the New York Rangers and goes, hmm, all right, you know, maybe we could do this in two or three years instead of four or five years. Right. Um, and that's far more palatable for ownership and likewise the fan base. How they execute it, um, you've got two real sharp minds, and I only identified the, the two in Gorton and Hughes because they are the face of the management team. Mm -hmm. But you look around the group now that they've put there, and they've got a real nice hockey operations department that isn't done growing yet in Montreal. Yeah. So they're going to they're gonna get some things done here, probably at the deadline and then certainly in the offseason. Well, Marco, I think you'll agree with this too. I think we've had this conversation too is – 
not only do they have a, a good set of, of scouts and, and hockey personnel there, but they've got fresh eyes. They, you mentioned it, Darren. I thought that was a key point where you have all these alumni that have a powerful influence on the narrative and what's said around the team and what goes on. Yeah. I almost feel like Molson said, you know what? Not that I'm not going to let that stay and, and not listen to them, but at the same time, we need to just create our own identity from within. We can't keep yeah. letting outside influences. So I respect this a lot. And I, a lot of people question them. And then let's get into it. I mean, Martin St. Louis, I think that was the biggest surprise of all is that they bring in a guy with no experience. But when you think about it, Darren, I mean, this guy's a rink rat, man. I know people, scouts, you know, and family advisors that would see him in the rinks in Connecticut and just watching amateur games, whether it's peewee, whether it's high school, prep school. He's always at the rink watching hockey. Oh, yeah. You know, I think he's kind of, I know he has no experience, but he seems just like one of these guys that was born for it. No doubt. Um, and I look, I, I think that the Montreal Canadiens, Ken Hughes especially, maybe envisioned a different role for Marty St. Louis when they first talked about, you know, whether Hughes was going to take the job as general manager in Montreal. And, you know, then he accepts the job and probably all the way through it, having lengthy conversations with Marty based on the relationship. And maybe thought he'd bring him in on the development side, at least yep. initially, right? And then all hell breaks loose. And, <laughs> you know, they're forced into a situation where they they just, they had to make a change. Yeah. They had to make a change. I mean, um, you know, not just for Cole Caulfield and Nick Suzuki and the young impressionable talent there, but for everybody, for the trade market, for some yeah. of these guys. <laughs> so, you know, you, you bring in Marty um, and... He's got nothing to lose. He's a Hall of Fame, a Hall of Fame hockey player. Yeah, you know, so he doesn't have a great successful start to his NHL coaching career. <clears throat> oh well, maybe he'll have other opportunities. So it's it's gone incredibly well for them. Um, but I I love the outside the box approach, uh, and maybe that doesn't happen without Jeff Gorton coming in, right? Like yes, Jeff Gorton can 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 feel the pressure of. A market. He worked in a pressurized market in New York. I mean, come on. Um, you know, the, the the French language issue. I'm sure he understands that. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're almost playing with house money at the point they brought in Marty St. Louis. Yeah. Again, I think they were bringing him in on the development side and then thought, OK, well, we got to do something. We've got a guy that's coming in anyway. He's a he's a decent coach at a minor hockey level. Let's let's. Just give them the ball and let them run with it and see what happens. So, I mean, the team in the city needed that to happen, though, yeah. right? You know, the, the National Hockey League is a better league when the Montreal Canadiens are a good story, when the Boston Bruins are a good story, when all of the, the impactful cornerstone organizations of the league are a good story. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they have to be successful teams, <laughs> just – that they're good stories Positivity. and their stories. Yeah. yeah. You know? So I, I think that in that regard, you know, you start with ownership. Molson deserves credit for that. And then Jeff Gorton deserves credit for taking the risks and the chances and bringing in Ken Hughes, who knows the player's side of thing better than anyone. So the direction looks positive at this point. And I, I really like that you bring up like St. Louis and how that affects the trade market. Cause that, that's actually where I wanted to bring this. Like the, when we were talking, uh, Jimmy and I, like well before um, you know his appointment, we were talking at how low the value of all the players on the Montreal Canadiens were, and we had mentioned Cole mm. Caulfield and Suzuki in terms of their development, but also veterans that could potentially move, uh, like a Jeff Petrie, uh, even Ben Chirot was, was didn't have the best month of December. So bringing in a guy like Martin Saint Louis um, could also be seen, and, and this is where I want to get your opinion, can also be seen as kind of an investment into the talent as they lead up to eventually, you know, liquidate a lot of these veterans in the next, say, two years, like the Rangers did uh, yeah. in stages with McDonough, JT Miller, Rick Nash, uh, Kevin yeah. Hayes, et cetera. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're bang on. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say that there's a high level of urgency to, to move all the players that we speculate on out. Right. I mean, again, you've got to get return, but the return has to make sense if you've got that player under contract. Why are you pushing out a player that, you know, maybe again, if, if trade deadline passes, um, teams don't have the success in the conclusion of the second half from the playoffs that they thought they were going to have. They have an injury. They've got a weakness. 
they go into the off season with way more financial flexibility mm -hmm. and maybe they look different at uh, an Armia or they look different at Jeff Petrie or a Brendan Gallagher or another player that, you know, we're, we're yeah. not even considering at, at this stage. So, and I think that that's an important distinction, um, you know, because I would even like, I, I, I can't imagine the Canadians don't trade Ben Chirot, but I know that Ben Chirot loves Montreal. I, he loves Montreal. Um, so, it, it wouldn't make sense because he's a pending unrestricted free agent, but guys like that are tough to replace, right? So if you're not getting what you need from the market on the trade front, is he young enough that you sit there and go, well, you know what, you know, we're getting a B grade prospect here. Does that yeah. make sense because he's a pending unrestricted or do we go, Hmm, you know what, you know, we're willing to have a little discussion here on, on the possibility of extension. I don't think that's going to happen. I really truly right. don't. It, you know, again, um, there's been so much talk and I feel like it would almost be unfair to Ben Chirot to circle back and say, hey, by the way, <laughs> well, you know, we're not getting what we, we want. Apparently, you know, the market doesn't see you the same way we do. But, you know, as we talk out loud, I, I think that that's definitely how they view some of those pieces. Right. So yeah. yep. maybe Habs fans are going to be a bit disappointed with the number of trades that are made. Yeah. I think what about, we've been, go ahead. Sorry, Marco. Go ahead. I think we've been proning a lot of patience in that case because as we talked about the Rangers, it was a staged teardown. Like it was yeah. year after year after year over three years. Yeah. And I think that's the case with Montreal. And today, you know, we, we've been talking about players like Joel Armia was obviously like a, a big deal because uh, nobody thought there was interest in him whatsoever. But one guy that we've been hearing particular interest in and out and is on TSN's trade board is Mike Hoffman. And I just wanted to run this by you because Chuck Fletcher today announced that they were looking for top six scoring yeah. and the Philadelphia Flyers are extremely weak on the left side, especially if they're going to go and trade a guy like Giroux uh, at the deadline. So I'm, you know, when we're talking about doing off season trades or looking at, at teams that want to be aggressive, I, th you know, we were talking about the patience and mm -hmm. with guys like Ben Sherrod, uh, guys like Arturi Lekkanen that we're talking about, you know, at, at this point of the season is, the situation in the summer going to be far more fluid for a player of someone like Hoffman or can there be a situation right now where it could work out in yeah. for the summer? Again, if, if, if you're in a market for a bit more scoring punch, uh, then yeah, there, there can be a market. I, I'm, I, I don't see it as a fit in Philadelphia, not that it, it, it won't happen. I just, Philadelphia is in a tough spot, right? You know, they've just had so many things kind of, swirl into the bowl for them um this season that i you know and and i guess i would look at hoffman's last two stops now you know it didn't work out in st louis um not a whole lot has worked out in montreal to be fair until recently you know he's not the only player but you know but it, you know, again teams are always looking for secondary scoring complementary players and and i think that mike hoffman can most definitely be that our terry Luckin and uh has piqued a lot of teams interest and that has to be because of his play of late yeah um, you know to a point where again do i think he's going to be traded probably um but you you know you you've got the montreal canadians going okay well wait a second here again you know <laughs> if if we if if we get consistent play out of him the way that he's played in the last 10 games 15 uh -huh. games whatever it is well maybe he could be a valuable piece here moving forward so i think that that's that's all part of it. Guys, you know how it works, right? You get to the trade deadline. Every team in the league <clears throat> has a whiteboard. And they've got tiering, right? So you've got your group of tier one forwards, tier two forwards, tier three forwards. Mm -hmm. So you guys can slot however you want which players should fit in tier two or tier three. But that's what happens. So maybe you get to you know your low second tier and Hoffman's still on the board, and you're like, look, we're going in the playoffs, and we we haven't got what we need. Maybe you take a swing. I could see that happening. Yeah, for sure. All right, listen, we're going to close it out, Darren. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time, but before you go, give yeah. us a funny, comical trade deadline story for you where I, I don't know if you can think off the top of your head where something something happened, you're about to report something, it went the other way or anything like that uh, you can remember. Ah, uh, you know what? I don't really. Um, oh, you know, 
choking on my uh, coffee. Yeah. You got too much espresso in there or what? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, one that comes to mind was actually Free Agent Frenzy, so kind of the okay, same. same thing, thing. yeah. Uh, Jeff Finger is signed by the Toronto Maple Leafs. Oh, yeah. Do you guys remember this? Yep. Yeah. And Bob Phenomenal. McKenzie and I are sitting with Gord Miller on set at TSN. And Gord says, it's what, three, four years or whatever. At four now. years, 3.5. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Gord says, total? And whomever he was talking with, the source, the agent, one of the managers or whatever, we could hear him scream in the in the phone. No, per year, you da, 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 da. <laughs> hangs up on him. And, and there have been a couple, like yeah. it, again, just trades or signings or whatnot, where you and we work very closely together at TSN, right? Whether yeah. it's me and Bob or now me and Pierre and Bob and, and Chris Johnson. So there's not too many things that surprise us where one guy just blurts something out. I mean, we work as a team, we work as right. as a unit. But back in the day, I mean, you're on the fly, man. You're getting stuff second by second. Yeah. And there are times where you just have to blurt it out. So, yeah, you know what? If I'd had some thought and I wasn't choking to death on my coffee, <laughs> yeah. I, I probably could have come up with something better than that. But that one is one of the old school legendary stories. There, there was one. Was it last draft or the draft before that kind of took everybody where a team just – and you see this all the time – where a team just goes completely off the board and you're kind of like, yeah, who's this guy? Yeah. No, no, like, no. Well, it no, happens every year. Yeah. I mean, remember everyone's surprised with Chinikov in, in, in Columbus and now he's playing in the NHL. It's, oh yeah. yeah. No, yeah. It, did, it, it definitely happens. Sinitian with the Bruins. I remember. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's like, legendary. <laughs> I can tell you, you remember Yanni Nienema when he was traded. Uh, let me oh, think Yanni of this. Nienema. Was it from the Islanders to the Oilers uh, or Oilers summer? I think it was Islanders to the Oilers. And I found out about it, right? Yep. So I report it. Uh, and Kevin Lowe was so angry <laughs> that we found out and reported it that the deal hadn't, like, I mean, it had been agreed to, but they hadn't had the trade call yet. Okay. And he was threatening to pull it off the table. He was threatening to cancel the deal because somebody leaked it, yeah. you know, oh to the gosh. media. I like now, the Oilers. Yeah. Have, have now GM... now it doesn't matter, right? Because I was just going to say that. Yeah. You know, now their social media is so immediate that the players are used to it. The agents are used to it. The, the managers are used to it. I mean, it's just part of life. Yeah, I was, that was going to be my question. Do GMs yeah. even mind now? Or they just accepted it? Oh, it, no, it no. Like... There, there's a few, man. Yarmo Kikalainen. Ah, uh, he hates it. When I <laughs> when I broke the line A trade to Columbus and uh -huh. Pierre-Luc Dubois coming back to Winnipeg, ooh, it wasn't, <laughs> I don't think he was mad at me. I just think yeah. he went after the Winnipeg Jets and say, how in the, right did this get out? So yeah, they don't, yeah. They, they, some of them appreciate it. None of them like it. And there's a few of them that absolutely hate it. I, I don't know what year it must've been like, uh, I want to say maybe 2006 because it was before Chiarelli took over in Boston, yeah. I think. And Brad Boyce was traded maybe to the Blues from the Bruins. And I had found out, you know, I got yeah, some, a source yeah. call. And I, I, I called Brad right away because I had a good relationship with him. And I wanted to get his reaction. You know, what do you think of the trade? He was just waking up from a game day nap. <laughs> and he says, what? I said, uh, you just got traded. He's like. Are you are you bleeping kidding me? What? <laughs> and he goes, I'll call you back. <laughs> you had no idea. It Lots of times that happens. I, uh, it's awesome. tough when that happens, man. It's tough. But hey, listen, Darren, great times. Thanks for joining us. And uh, listen, when you're up in Montreal for the draft, we owe you a couple pints of Guinness. And uh, nah, no worries. You know, we appreciate it. And happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. All right, guys. I'll be I got working, my shirt right here. I see it, Murph. <laughs> I see it. Uh, and that normally is. I'm not Irish, but that's a. Uh, that's a, a big event for me and my buddies. And uh -huh. because it's pre-trade deadline. I was just going to say. Not doing anything. Yeah. I'm going to be in Montreal Brutal. for parade weekend. And yeah. the parade's the day before the deadline. So I'm just going to lock <laughs> her down. Yeah. I might do my fun on Friday. That's that's, that's looking All like right. a fun day. But, uh, oh, dear. We'll get, you, we'll get you up there. And it should be fun, too. That's a good thing, too. We bring up that draft. I mean, yeah. what a great momentum that Montreal with the trade deadline and then the draft. 
they can just sort of get the fans back into it. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be great for that city. No, no question about that. I mean, anytime Montreal hosts an event, it's world-class, right? Yep. I mean, yep. nobody does it better. No. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to it for sure. The idea of doing something virtual or having to move it, you know, because oh. of restrictions and whatnot, man, that wouldn't have been good. So no, it's good stuff. Good thing. Well, I'm Jimmy Murphy, Marco D'Amico, and that's Darren Drager. Thanks for joining us on the latest Montreal Hockey Now podcast. We'll talk to you next week live from McLean's Pub in Montreal for St. Paddy's Weekend.